In this video, we will explore the four trace types that are available with the trace network in ArcGIS Pro 2.6 and walk through some scenarios with each. We'll take a look at connected trace, as well as the upstream, downstream, and shortest path traces, and discuss related concepts and options, such as connectivity and traversability, flow direction, validate consistency, condition barriers, functions, and result types. The trace network offers four different trace types. Let's take a closer look at these in ArcGIS Pro. Up here on the Trace Network ribbon, if we select the Data tab, we can see the trace types in the tool group here. We have the Connected Trace, the Upstream Trace, the Downstream Trace, and the Shortest Path Trace. The ability of a feature to be traced in the network is impacted by its connectivity and traversability. Connectivity describes the state in which two features in the network are connected through geometric coincidence whereas traversability describes situations where two features are connected and also have appropriate attributes that allow the trace to pass through or traverse the feature. For example, let's say I wanted to trace all third order streams in my network using a connected trace. While there are various second and first order streams connected, these would not be traversable based upon the condition barrier I set to specify traversal of third order streams only. The traversability of features is defined using advanced options and network attributes in the Trace Geoprocessing tool. Let's take a look at this example with a connected trace. Here we have a hydrologic data set from New Zealand. I'm going to zoom to the Griffin Creek bookmark I have up here, and then place a starting point here near the Griffin Creek Reserve. Starting points denote the starting location of a trace, and can be placed interactively on network features using the Trace Locations pane, as I'm doing here, or specified by providing another feature class that contains starting point locations. I'll first run a basic connected trace using this starting point with the defaults. When that completes, you can see that over 2,200 features have been selected, which define this watershed. Let's now configure an advanced trace to return only larger connected streams, those that are fourth order and above. To do this, we'll configure a condition barrier here under Advanced Options. I'll use the Stream Motors Network attribute and configure this dynamic barrier so that all connected features are traced until a line with a stream order of three or less is encountered. I'll now rerun this connected trace with a condition barrier set. When that completes, you can see that the selection set is greatly reduced. Only 627 features were selected. However, I see what appear to be some third order streams included in the result set, and I specified to only include fourth order and above. The reason for this is that I have the include barrier features option selected here on the trace tool. This is configured by default and includes the features that serve as barriers in the trace result. By disabling this option, I can rerun the trace. I then see that only 310 features were selected. This is more in line with what I was expecting from the result. Let's open the attribute table here to take a look at the selected features. This demonstrates how barriers can be used to control the traversability of features in a trace. While we're here, let's take a look at another advanced option, Output Conditions. What if we wanted to return only connected fourth order streams with a sinuosity index above a certain value, so that we could review only those that display a certain level of meander? If I were to specify sinuosity as a condition barrier, this would prevent connected segments from being returned, because the trace would stop when a line with a value below the value specified was encountered. Output conditions don't impact the network's traversability, but instead, they constrain what is returned in the result set. With my condition barrier still configured, I'm going to configure an output condition to return only river lines with a sinuosity above a certain value. Let's use 1.2. And then I'll rerun the trace. While all river lines that meet my condition barrier were traversed, only those that meet the output condition were returned. Let's now take a look at the upstream and downstream trace options. There's no concept of source and sync in the trace network. The upstream and downstream traces both use flow direction to determine directionality. 
Flow direction is based on the digitized direction of edge features in the network and is set when the network topology is enabled. This can also be updated for a feature class or even selected features using the set flow direction geoprocessing tool. So let's take a look with an upstream trace. I'm going to go to a different bookmarked area and then place a new starting point here near the mouth of the Huronai River. I'll first run an upstream trace from this starting point without any advanced configuration set. You can see that my trace failed pretty much immediately. If I view the details, you can see that this is because a dirty area was encountered within the trace path. I want to draw your attention to the validate consistency option here on the trace tool. This is enabled by default. This option specifies whether an error will be returned during a trace if any dirty areas are encountered. This is done as a warning to indicate you may be traversing features that are inconsistent or out of date with the network topology. I can see the dirty area that it's complaining about here. When a dirty area is encountered, the error will display the feature class name and global ID of the offending feature class for further investigation. While you can disable the option to trace through dirty areas, it's always a good idea to leave this enabled to ensure accurate trace results. Let's now validate the network topology and to clean this dirty area and then rerun that upstream trace. When this completes, you can see that over 5,700 features have been selected. If I zoom to the results, I see an odd gap here in the middle of the watershed. Let's zoom in to see what appears to be the barrier feature. Taking a closer look, nothing appears unusual about this segment at first glance. If I run a quick connected trace though, I can see that this is selected. So there must be an issue with the flow direction on this line. I can view the flow direction by clicking on the display flow direction command here on the data tab. This creates a temporary feature class in the default geodatabase of my project and displays a flow direction arrows layer in the map for all network edge features within the current extent. With this layer added, I can see that the segment's flow direction is going in the opposite direction. I can either redigitize the line or flip the flow direction to go against the digitized direction. For the purposes of this demo, I'll do the latter and update the flow direction for the line. To update the flow direction for this feature, I'll first select the line and then open the geoprocessing pane to search for and open the set flow direction tool. This tool will run against the selection set in the map, so I'll just ensure that the target feature class is set to river lines and that this is set to flow against the digitized direction. With that complete, I'll rerun display flow direction to update the direction arrows and the extent. There, that looks a lot better. I'll now zoom back out and rerun the upstream trace. You can see that the line segment we updated the flow direction on is no longer acting as a barrier for the upstream trace. All connected features upstream from the starting point placed at the river mouth have been selected and returned. Let's now take a look at the downstream trace which works on the same principle. If I were to place a starting point here near the headwaters of the same river, I can run a downstream trace from this point to the sea. Before I run this, however, let's take a look at another one of the advanced options available with the trace tool, functions. Functions allow me to perform calculations on network attributes in the trace result. For example, let's say that I wanted to understand the elevation difference between the starting point and the end of the trace where the river intersects the South Pacific. I could create a function that sums the elevation difference for the trace segments using the elevation change network attribute. Let's configure that to take a look at the output. I'll use the add function to sum the elevation change attribute of the segments traversed by the trace. When that completes, I'll zoom to the results and view the details to see the output of the function I configured here under the messages section.
For our last example, let's take a look at the shortest path trace. The shortest path trace helps us to identify the shortest path between two starting points in the network. This is helpful in cases where multiple paths exist between point A and point B. The shortest path is calculated using a numeric network attribute and be configured to calculate cost or distance based paths. If you don't have a network attribute configured, you can use the default shape length network attribute generated by the system, which is what we're going to use in this example to demonstrate. I'll navigate to a section of the Weihu River where there are a few braided stream segments. I can use the shortest path trace to identify the shortest distance between these two starting points that I'll place upstream and downstream from this point. I'll then select shortest path from the option up here on the ribbon to open the trace tool. The path direction parameter provides the ability to find the shortest path upstream, downstream, or without using flow direction. I'll choose downstream path for this example, and then choose the shape length field for the shortest path network attribute. I'll also add a function to output the distance of the path between the two starting points I've placed. You can see here that the shortest path between the two points based on shape length was returned in the trace result. Since my starting points were both placed on line features, when I run the trace, the entire line segment is selected, and this value contributes to the total distance traveled between the two points. Since both my starting points were placed on line features in this example, when I ran the trace, the entire line segment was selected, and this value contributes to the total distance traveled between the two points. If I view the details of the trace result and expand messages, you can see the distance traveled. 16,079 meters. That's nearly 10 miles. What if I want the exact distance traveled? To answer this, let's take another look at one of the advanced options on the trace tool, result types. By scrolling to the bottom of the trace tool, you can see the result types parameter. This provides me with some additional options to control how trace results are returned. The default option is to return trace results as a selection set. With the result types parameter, I can also choose the aggregated geometry option to output my trace results to an output multipart feature class. This creates output feature classes, which aggregate the geometry of all point and line features in the network. I can use the default temporary feature classes created in my project's home geodatabase, or select other feature classes to store the results. This is helpful to return partial geometry of line features in the trace result, and can also be used to compare the output for multiple trace operations. I'm going to leave this as is to output aggregated geometry. I'll then run this to create an output point and line feature layer in my map. With that complete, let me change the symbology of the output aggregated geometry feature classes so that we can better see the result. I'll then open the attribute table to review the shape length of the output. Comparing this value against the result returned by the function with our selection, this is a difference of over 1140 meters. That's nearly three quarters of a mile. With this, you can see the value that the advanced options such as result types provide to return more precise trace results. That about wraps up our review of the trace types available with the Trace Network in ArcGIS Pro 2.6. I hope you've learned something and found this valuable. Review the help documentation to learn more about the Trace Network trace types, and let us know what you think by visiting the Trace Network community on GeoNet. Thanks.